Hi, Andrew. How are you? Hello, Hi. how are you? Good, good. Good to see you. First time <laughs> online. Uh, yeah. We actually read your book very early. I think two years ago, you published Formulations, the book. Uh, yeah, we take the book as a reading material in our uh, uh, different courses. So, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, with your book. <laughs> I'm I'm great. I'm I'm glad it's I'm glad it's useful. Yeah, it's it was a lot of fun to put together. I'll also talk about it to, a little bit today as well. So yeah, great. great. So it's a great honor to invite you as a first speaker uh, to this um, PhD seminar. So uh, the next, I will firstly introduce the event. Actually, this is a sequence of the Digital Future event, and PhD uh, consortium is part of it. And you are the, the first speaker and uh, followed by some other uh, uh, prominent uh, professors all over the world. So, and then uh, uh, introduce uh, you and uh, uh, you can, you, the screen will give, give to you later. So shall we start right now? I want to share my screen firstly. Sure. Um, I just, I quick, quick question, Philip. So there's yeah. a, there's a break sort of like midway yeah. through the presentation. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, okay. how, how long yeah. do you want the break to be? Normally uh, we subdivide it into two parts. You can have a break in the middle. Uh, if you want to go straight all the way to the end, it also, uh, also, okay. So uh, it's uh, actually, it's, it's, it's two lectures uh, and, and you can follow by some discussion. So I will uh, make the start and uh, I will participate in another uh, important meeting. So Chao from our school will organize the discussion uh, session. Uh, I will uh, take a look at all the, the videos uh, after this lecture. So that's the okay. uh, uh, tonight uh, organization. So I will start. Can you see my screen? Okay. Good evening and good morning, distinguished um, guests and all the Digital Future friends, uh, all the participants of Digital Futures uh, uh, workshops. Welcome, participate Digital uh, Future Doctor Consortium. And tonight, actually, this is the first lecture. And welcome to Architectural Digital Futures uh, ADF Doctor Doctoral Consortium Lecture Series. Uh, which focus on the development in architecture in the midst of digital transformation and organized by the College of Architecture and Urban Planning of Tongji University in collaboration with the universities, uh, different design firms and research institutions around the world. So these courses encourage innovation, collaboration, and exchange the new ideas and also focus on the scientific study of uh, digital design theory technology and also different kinds of methodologies. The sequence of the global PhD program is based on the sharing uh, courses, theory of digital design in architecture. And we invite uh, actually international leading scholars and architects in the fields of digital architecture to give a six days um, academic lectures series. And the lectures will be uh, held from June the 17th to June the 20th. 22nd, with two sessions actually each day. We have the morning session and also we have evening session. Uh, so um, we welcome everyone to join us uh, in this special uh, uh, PhD consortium. And uh, uh, actually the speakers, including uh, Andrew Witt to tonight, and then tomorrow uh, will be Shi Chao Li uh, from UVA and followed by Alejandro uh, uh, Jacopolo who is a former dean of uh, University of Princeton and right now the director of AZPML uh, Design Office. And Aki Mangus will give a lecture uh, uh, after, afterwards, including um, uh, Anthony Picon and uh, Mara Capo as well. And Neil Leach will give a sequence of six lectures in the morning session uh, for the PhD uh, students. So that's the uh, the uh, the lecture uh, consortium uh, in uh, of digital in architecture uh, this year. And actually we have some uh, special assess, uh, assessment uh, and grading uh, uh, regulations. 
the students, um, uh, and we will actually assess your performance through three aspects, including the class attendance, performance, and final review. And each student is required to complete a research on the relevant topic and write a 200 words essay illustrated with clear citation and reference. And this sub submission date is July the 3rd, actually 2023 this year. So uh, after the, the digital future uh, workshops. And uh, this is the, uh, the weight and the grading system. You can take a look. So actually this PhD consortium courses is based on digital futures, architecture digital future event. And we established this platform 12 years ago. This is the 13th year. And it has been an organization aiming at offering free education accessible for all, course, uh, all the students and architects across the world, and especially to the uh, different PhD program, including China and all over the world, to sharing uh, the, 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 uh, the, the credits uh, from, from uh, these courses. For example, this course uh, in Tongji is two uh, credits. And being a, a digital platform, the program includes online workshops, uh, lectures, and conferences to promote discussions on the, the broad range of contemporary issues in the discipline of architecture, with a particular emphasis on the computational design and fabrication technologies, while addressing broader ethical and social issues, including environmental concern within our evolving technological uh, culture. So this is the, uh, the, the, the brief uh, introduction, also followed by uh, uh, nine days workshops. We will start from uh, the 24th of June uh, to uh, July uh, the 2nd. So this is nine days workshops um, as well. And this is actually the digital futures uh, uh, instructors. Actually, we, we, we attract in the digital futures instructors from all over the world, you can see. And all the uh, join uh, our events over the past 12 years, you can see is quite diverse, including uh, from China, from the United States, and also from uh, uh, South America, Africa as well. So this is a, a totally global uh, uh, view for the digital participants. Actually, we will upload all the lectures to both YouTube and Bilibili in China. YouTube uh, around the world. And actually, this is a lecture, a lecture series. Right now, uh, we already have like more than 300 lectures on the platform, and the viewers more than 1.5 million uh, viewers uh, for all the lectures uh, over the past uh, 12 years. And this year, actually, we organized um, um, uh, uh, 23 uh, offline uh, workshops in Shanghai. And also we have five online workshops and totally uh, 28 uh, workshops. And uh, uh, we focus more on offline this year because over the past three years, uh, because of the COVID, we go most of the, uh, the workshops online. So we, uh, this year, I think it's a great opportunity to invite a lot of friends coming back uh, and advisors coming back to teaching uh, in Shanghai. And we'll uh, make exhibition starting from July the 2nd uh, to uh, September the 2nd uh, uh, in uh, Tongji in Shanghai campus. Uh, so welcome to uh, take a visit uh, of the uh, exhibition if possible. And also we have an online, uh, 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 online uh, exhibition uh, uh, um, uh, space uh, and will be open on the website. Uh, please check it. So that's the background research of the whole event. And uh, as well as uh, a special journal we uh, launched last year, Architecture Intelligence, we're collecting, collaborating with um, Springer uh, Publisher and actually focus on uh, the special scenarios, including the smart habitat, virtual habitat, and the spatial habitat. And we uh, 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 make a lot of research uh, papers. They actually focus on the design simulation optimization construction operation and inhabitation uh, crossing different disciplines, including civil engineer, environmental engineer, computer science, mathematics, and social science as well. So um, uh, we have a lot of edit, uh, editorial members and uh, in the future, invite more friends to uh, join us. So also, uh, I think today uh, we have the special guest and um, um, Andrew Beach, and also we give you an invitation uh, if you would like to publish any, uh, 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 maybe 
one special uh, um, paper which can relate strongly to the topic tonight, you'll be welcome uh, to publish in, in uh, artificial intelligence. So let me introduce uh, Andrew Wick. Actually, uh, before the lecture, I talked to Andrew because we we're actually familiar with uh, your theory and the, your thinking because of your book uh, and the formulations. I think it is a very uh, important book. Uh, in my uh, thesis uh, class, I introduced this book as, as one of the reading material um, uh, uh, to my students. So uh, we know you because of your book. Uh, and Andrew is, um, I think, is an emerging uh, new star in the uh, architecture theory, specialized in architect in digital. So I would like to make a introduction of him. Andrew Witt is an associate professor in practice at Harvard GSD and teaching uh, researching on the relationship of geometry data AI and the machines to architecture design and culture. Trained in both architecture and mathematics, he has a particular interest in the technological, synthetic, and logical rigorous approach to form. He is also co-founder with uh, uh, Tobias Note of the Certain Measures, a Boston Berlin-based studio that combines design and data for the systematic and the scalable approaches uh, to the spatial problems. Uh, the work of certain measures is uh, in the, the permanent collection of uh, Center Pompidou, and he has been exhibited at Pompidou, the Barbican Center, the Museum of the Future, the Canadian uh, 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 Center for Architecture, among the others. So I think uh, that's the, the brief introduction for Andrew. Uh, we're looking forward uh, to the, this very interesting topic, certain measures data, media, and words. So welcome, Professor Andrew Bitt. The screen is yours. Thank you, I will quit the sharing. Thank you so, so much, Philip. Um, let's see. Uh, can you see my slides okay? Yes, no problem. Uh, well, th thanks for that introduction. Thank you so much for this generous invitation. I'm really delighted to be uh, to be with you. Um, thank you for your kind words about the book. I'll have a few words to say about it um, in the second half of the presentation, and would also welcome any any questions around it if um, if those have been prompted by your previous discussions. Um, so today, I'm going to share, I guess, two main topics. Uh, I wanted to introduce to you some of the work uh, that we do at Certain Measures around data-driven design, and particularly how data can be used as a proxy for many other kinds of material, operational, social, and cultural dimensions of our world. So the presentation will be about computational design in general, but it will be particularly related to this idea of transdisciplinary and transscalar design, um, as well as aspects of computational representation. How do we represent computational processes? How do we communicate them? So the projects will range from um, extreme reuse to more speculative projects that show how the digital world might leak into physical space, um, or how they might uh, imagine data as a way to model uh, global bioremediation. So the work explores data as a creative medium of design that is almost a common language between, between human and machine perception, vision, and understanding. So I'll also mention formulations, which deals with the sort of uh, prehistory of uh, digital and mathematical design, and really gets to the sort of like theoretical core of um, a kind of practice like ours. In fact, I wrote, formulations as a kind of like alibi uh, for what certain measures does and this sort of uh, way to say that uh, what we do actually has a specific kind of history. So uh, this is the general structure of the lecture. The first half I'll be talking about certain measures, this notion of paradigm shift, I guess, from seeing to scanning uh, as we move into the sort of like post-human world, notion of extreme reuse, and then the way that we might apply those techniques of extreme reuse to scan and re, uh, re-understand the city. We'll have a short break, and then in the second half, um, I'll talk a little bit more about AI as it's embedded in objects, uh, and this notion of animalizing AI instead of humanizing it. 
Uh, and then we'll think about scanning, not the sort of um, the technosphere, the sort of like space of architecture in the city, but the space of nature. And then finally, I'll try to bring those threads together with a discussion about formulations. So uh, Certain Measures is a studio that bridges design, art, technology, and we're particularly interested in this shared world of humans and machines and how they both see and think. And we see data and mathematized design actually as a bridge between uh, those aspects of the world, a bridge between the human and machinic. So we apply mathematical techniques, data science, AI, and transdisciplinary inclinations to a range of projects uh, from sculptural to architectural to video. Each project has an architectural dimension or explores questions from architecture, particularly around design process and uh, the sort of ways that we imagine uh, architecture and imagine the world that, we, uh, that we're in. So we omnivorously embrace working across scales from the material to the planetary. Uh, and we've worked with industries as diverse as finance, manufacturing, government, uh, and medical devices. And so today I'll share a few projects that demonstrate this synthetic, scalar, transdisciplinary, and data-driven uh, approach. Um, certain measures. So this is a short. Uh, this is a short trailer for certain measures. But since I haven't shared the audio, I'll give you a mini narration. Uh, this gives you a flavor or a sampling of some of the projects we'll actually talk about today. Uh, but it also gives a sense of the fact that there are various kinds of media that we're trying to communicate this digitally or data-driven design transformation through. So in particular, most of our projects have two halves. There's a half which is physical, something which is in the world, something which we build, which we create, something that's tectonic. And then on the other hand, there's a media manifestation of our work. So those media manifestations are often videos or immersive experiences that allow you to enter the space of computation and gain an intuition for what's happening from, uh, uh, from a digital point of view. And this is something, you know, those videos and immersive experiences are somehow like a cross between data visualization, process documentation, but also a kind of like vision of how the machine might be understanding the kinds of problems that we, uh, that we pose to it. So um, our approach is um, naturally transdisciplinary, uh, but at the core, we are designers. Um, we have a special interest in, I would say, three other fields, philosophy, history, and mathematics, which in turn give us access to certain intellectual frameworks, which we can then reapply to problems of design. So uh, since mathematics is this sort of lingua franca of the sciences, and data is sort of right there with it, uh, we feel like a, a mastery or sort of like um, a use of mathematics and data actually gives us access to a, what, a much wider range uh, of uh, disciplines across the sciences. Um, so the results of these kinds of uh, applications of new methodologies into design uh, result in these specific products of uh, cultural, architectural, and industrial uh, impact. And those are ultimately the sort of like craft of the designers. So although we're very interested in methodology, probably what we're most interested in is making things. So uh, our work has always had a strong connection between geometry and materiality. And that might be partially because my uh, partner and I actually uh, spent a lot of time together at Gary Technologies. So Gary Technologies uh, was a technology spinoff of Frank Gehry's architecture office. And there we saw very intense analytic, geometric, and data science challenges to realize a number of very ambitious projects. So I'll mention just a couple to give you a flavor of where we're coming from. The first is the Fondation Louis Vuitton, which is uh, the most significant new cultural institution in Paris uh, in a generation. So I was involved in virtually every aspect of the design and execution of this project for about four years, uh, including building computational infrastructure to integrate the engineering constraints of all aspects of the building from over 400 contributors into a common database. So along the way, I developed hundreds of software tools to enable that integration. 
Uh, one example is a unique combination of software and material research uh, to achieve the building's novel curved glass facade. So the glass facade is composed of about 3,500 individually curved panels produced um, in an unprecedented way using a mechanical furnace that's usually used for um, uh, experimental car design, which folds glass into cylindrical pieces. Uh, and so I invented a patented process that applied material geometry uh, of this, so these cylindrical patterns uh, onto this curved glass facade. So a second example, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, shows an integration between ambient environmental systems and the intricate geometry of this massive dome. So uh, in collaboration with the National Energy uh, Lab in France and of course, Atelier Jean Nouvel, we developed methods uh, to inversely calculate the transparency needed in order to achieve very specific microclimate conditions underneath the dome. And then I also built software for the generation of hundreds of pages of fabrication documents uh, that precisely find the assembly logic of the domes to produce those microclimates. The techniques we pioneered at Gary Technologies were powerful, but at the end of the day, I was interested in thinking about them not as sort of consulting services, which come almost after the design, but instead migrating those into the core of design itself. So I wanted to build a new design office from the ground up that took those techniques as the substance and craft uh, of design. And that, uh, that office was Certain Measures. Now, our early work at Certain Measures, and I would say our work up to today actually continues this very strong interest in the reciprocity between geometry and material. So uh, in particular, our early projects looked at how to develop methods to construct complex surfaces from sheet material um, in uh, with as little material as, uh, as possible. So uh, we developed also a kind of like combinatorial technique for generating minimal surfaces based on uh, knot structures. And uh, these knots, if you look closely at the hard edge of this surface, this is actually one continuous curve. It's one curve that generates, uh, generates what's called a spanning surface. And we developed a sort of combinatorial catalog of these spanning surfaces because they also have very interesting spatial properties. Um, they fold and twist and torque and sort of um, envelop space in very, um, very compelling sort of ways. And we were interested in thinking about how we could use these architecturally. Now, of course, to build those architecturally, uh, we have to develop some uh, uh, some clever and sort of efficient techniques to discretize and construct uh, those forms. And so first with mock-ups, small mock-ups, and then larger ones, we developed a highly rigorous way of building these kinds of illusional objects. Uh, so using a process that's similar to um, AI object recognition and image segmentation, we built an ML process to analyze and slice up this, these kind of not surface objects uh, into strips which minimize torsion uh, in resulting structures, uh, which twist basically as little as possible. So we could build these in a matter of a, of a few hours. So in this way, we can build some uh, highly complex forms from very few exactly calculated pieces. Uh, the intricate graphic patterns generated by this method um, create this very interesting sort of like ambiguity between two and three dimensions that are reminiscent uh, or that amplify the, the sort of um, perceptual effects uh, of those knot structures. So, you know, as young designers, we were trying to build as cheaply as possible. Uh, but even with these highly efficient methods, we still wasted probably 30 to 35% of the raw material. And so we began to ask ourselves, is there a way to build this cheaper? Well, nothing is cheaper than garbage. Uh, and so we wanted to go one step further than just optimizing a process, uh, new material. We wanted to eliminate uh, or reuse existing waste. And you know, this has become an increasingly critical question in design. How do we manage the waste of the world's demolished buildings? How do we 
minimize the waste of um, uh, architecture, engineering, and construction, which ultimately, in the US at least, comprises about 30% of landfill volume, just a vast, vast amount. So our answer to this issue was a process that we called Dynas Scrap, which is a data-driven um, technique that uses, that designs new structures from existing waste. And so uh, using a custom 40 dimension machine learning and pattern recognition engine that we developed, the project stitches together irregular construction scrap into new forms. It's a little bit like assembling uh, an unknown puzzle from random pieces. So that finds the unique best use for each piece in a new structure through a sophisticated process of scanning and classification. And then with it, we can match what we have, this sort of like scrap material, to what we want to make. So, uh, so using computer vision and machine learning, we can actually invert the typical process of art and design. Instead of material being something that follows design, we can begin with material and see what we can build. It's a little bit like the old Lucan idea where you build what you use, you find out what the brick wants to be and you build that. So we're finding out what garbage wants to be and building, uh, building that or elevating it. So uh, Mind the Scrap uses big data to tackle big waste. And here you see some sort of like prototypical results of our tool. Um, uh, last year we had a show at the, or maybe it's been two years, but at the new AI Art Center in Shanghai, uh, which is a gallery specifically devoted to machine learning and art. So that show featured several of our pieces, including a large version of the geometric method um, that we applied in Mind the Scrap. And what I like about that piece is that it has this sort of like fractured, fragmented feeling that something is emerging. It's like something is breaking out of a shell. Um, there's uh, something which is partway through, partway between a coherent form and, you know, noise. So, you know, garbage is noise. What we're trying to do here is elevate that noise or reconfigure that noise so we're just on the verge of making it a signal, of making it something coherent, making it something new. So uh, what we have here is a kind of tr transition or a shift in paradigm in the way we not only see, but create. And so historically, designers see things, they see a lot of things, they study precedents, and then they make. Uh, with these kinds of like ML and AI augmented processes, we can shift towards a paradigm that's a little bit more about scanning and generating, where we can train um, processes to, to see the way that we might see or have certain kinds of visual intuitions that we might have. And we can embed those in scanners that we then scale up. And then from those scanners, which can be applied to vastly larger amounts of information and data, we can generate new kinds of forms. So uh, we've started this process by actually disassembling some existing buildings. So uh, this is a, um, a, a disused uh, dacha, sort of like summer home in an old East German nudist colony uh, that we disassembled as a part of a, a version of Mind the Scrap. And uh, as part of this process, we now photograph and forensically catalog these disassembled pieces. Now with photography, we can begin to think about the sort of like textures, the weathering quality, colors, all of these other kinds of things that um, you can't really get from geometry alone. And so with this, um, we, can, uh, um, we can begin to create a process that we call cloud fill. So the idea of cloud fill, is it's an extension of mind the scrap that sees the process of disassembly and rescanning as something which uh, is not just for just for us, but something that exists in the cloud and could be potentially a new system of waste reuse for uh, entire communities. And so this cloud fill idea is sort of a play on this. Uh, the notion that not only are these materials going into this sort of like digital cloud for which they sort of like, uh, for which emerge new kinds of structures, but actually that they exist um, in, 
in the more broad cloud that um, everyone around the planet can access. So uh, because the disassembled pieces are often linear, they have a vault construction logic, which you can kind of see uh, on the left. And so the, the frames which bound this structure uh, induce this almost Rubik's cube-like transformation of these underlying vaults. So again, this sort of like reciprocity between the geometry of uh, small scale material and the geometry of global form is something that's um, really a kind of critical, uh, critical idea uh, for us. So we see buildings as temporary states of matter, which can have designed transitions uh, between previous and next states. And I think this idea of designing those transitions and the and a building as a temporary state of matter is a really critical and sort of, um, it's a really critical step towards a more responsible understanding of architecture. Uh, and so as a temporary state, we can think about their like larger process around the building as a fundamental and integral part of the architectural design process. So here you can see a couple of renderings of this sort of like reconstructed dacha or this sort of like dacha of the future built from the dacha of the past. Um, and uh, a full scale reconstructed corner of this uh, ML generated house uh, was hosted at uh, Futurium. So Futurium uh, is a major new museum of the future in Berlin. Uh, our piece was part of the inaugural show, the opening show there um, uh, a couple of years ago. So what I find really kind of like, what I find fun about the final installation is of course, we've sort of like taken the pieces of the initial dacha and uh, constructed this new possible form. But we also have these sort of like fragments of the 1970s wallpaper that have been combinatorially uh, reconfigured. So this notion of uh, a kind of like patchwork or a sort of like assembly from fragments is something that for us kind of seeps into many parts of what uh, of what we do. Um, there's also this very funny that became like a, a site for some fashion shoots, which was which was unexpected, but I think kind of fun. So uh, we imagine a kind of data data enabled system that could extend to a planetary reuse repository by scanning building stock around the globe and generatively creating scenarios for their use, we can reimagine material logistics uh, by bringing end of life and beginning of life processes together in architectural design. So uh, what often happens or what happens sometimes with our work at certain measures is that we'll develop what we call a provocative prototype, um, sort of like mine the scrap, and then we'll end up partnering with industrial partners to, uh, to apply it or take it further. And so that was the case with uh, Mind the Scrap with, um, we uh, connected with an industrial partner, uh, Reader, they're a fiber reinforced concrete company. So they make these sort of like beautiful concrete fiber panels for facades. Um, this process, basically they'll cast uh, a sheet of concrete fiber and they'll use water jets to cut those pieces. But often there are what are called like off cuts. They're the scrap pieces from that process. So concrete is a carbon intensive material. And so they felt really bad about putting it into a landfill. And so basically there was kind of like this warehouse full of these scraps. And so they approached us and they had um, sort of like the sort of like digital traces, the sort of like digital outlines of all of these scrap materials. And so they asked us to think about an approach that they could use to reuse uh, that material. And so, uh, so that's exactly what we did. We basically applied some of the logic of mine the scrap to this very interesting sort of uh, uh, fiber reinforced concrete waste. And at the same time, uh, we developed a series of data uh, browsing tools that would allow them to see not only the, the, the data set of the material itself, but also how that data could be recombined in different contexts. So this is a good example of these kind of like two manifestations of what we do, the sort of physical manifestation in an object or an architecture or a proposal, and the digital manifestation, 
which is all about this sort of like process of developing um, ways to make data readable, to make data understandable. So the project sort of combines data science with architecture uh, to show a future for uh, computational sustainability. And, uh, you know, so beyond designing these facade pieces, we're actually designing the data, designing the data structure and the way that data is sort of uh, experienced. So that the computational process extends to specific details that allow these, these panels to actually be assembled. Um, and because these irregularly shaped panels have a kind of cascading impact on the underlying structure, uh, which has to be designed for their uh, for their irregularity. So, you know, as anybody who's done this kind of work knows, complexity is never skin deep. There's a whole series of other things that have to be put in place and work synthetically uh, in order for uh, the entire uh, the entire proposal to work. So uh, one of the things that we are fascinated by at, at certain measures is taking a method at one scale and seeing what other scales it can work at. So we've talked about mind the scrap as this sort of like architectural method, something that works at the scale of buildings and building material. Uh, but we were also really interested in thinking about how we can apply this at large and smaller scales as well. And this project, which I'm showing now, um, is basically the application of a mind the, mind the scrap process to the scale of products. So as we were developing mind the scrap, uh, we were very inspired by this Japanese craft of kitsugi, and kitsugi is a uh, is a method where if you have a ceramic vessel which has been dropped and shattered, you rebuild that uh, vessel with sutures of gold, and so those sutures of gold. They they allow they don't give you exactly the same vessel back, but they give you something that's actually elevated, but still shows the sort of like fragments that that sort of like I don't know like trauma that's kind of like destruction. So we were interested in applying that uh, idea, but not to recreate new vessels, but create entirely new kinds of uh, kinds of vessels. And so that was uh, uh, our project Kitsugi Plus Plus. So here you can see the sort of like media, um, the media vision of the project, where basically we have these shattered pieces of ceramics, um, which then, again, we don't know where those ceramic pieces are coming from. We can't reconstruct exactly the same piece, so we're constructing new uh, new vessels uh, from it. We're ennobling them and creating these complex new forms. So the process as you can see, creates this kind of like galaxy or universe of shards that are then arranged and reassembled using um, ML processes. So we, you know, we couldn't afford gold. And so uh, we used a sort of 3D printed armature actually to bring all of these pieces together. And so the 3D printed armature has an exact um, sort of tolerance for each of the edges of each of the individual pieces that it's intended to receive. So it's a kind of frame uh, that can then be fused uh, together. So here you see a few of those uh, resulting prototypes. So again, there's a physical piece here and the digital piece was the series of kind of like immersive installations. So you would walk into this room and you would see this galaxy of shards um, sort of, uh, vertiginously circulating around you and occasionally coming to these moments of coherence and then shattering again. So again, it's this sort of like oscillation between signal and noise, this experience of the moment of becoming of design. So, you know, like Mind the Scrap itself, we also started working with industrial partners to think about Kitsugi. So uh, Laufen uh, is a very high-end sort of like bathroom fixtures company. Um, so they work a lot with ceramics. And so they were really intrigued by this process uh, because occasionally they also have to sort of like repair ceramic vessels or they have to, um, or things go wrong in the factory. It's they, they, have, they ha have some waste. So how could they think about a more circular process of reuse uh, with Kitsugi? So uh, as part of our proposal, we developed a, an exhibition for them uh, where we took a series of their products 
and imagined uh, how they could be um, uh, rethought using the kind of kitsugi process. And so here you see some some sinks, some toilets, um, some you know various you know another sink, a bidet that are actually using this kitsugi process. And what I think is interesting here is that you know these these fixtures are things that are almost invisible to us. They're part of they're actually part of our architectural experience, but they're this almost like secondary aspect of that. And so we were really interested in elevating those and bringing them to sort of this next level uh, using uh, using kitsugi. So here you can see some of the uh, some of the videos and again sort of like media experience uh, that we put together for uh, Laufen and ultimately uh, Laufen has an, an exhibition space in Berlin and so we had an exhibition there that sort of like showed this potential future um, for um, you know the the household sort of like water fixtures and one of the things that I liked most about this. Uh, is that uh, Olivia Huang, who's um, one of our uh, one of our very uh, talented um, collaborators at CM, uh, she took the previous exhibition announcements for other um, exhibitions that were in that space and overprinted them with the invitation and announcement for our uh, for our show. And so not only were we recycling uh, or reusing uh, the Laufen fixtures, we were reusing the the materials of the exhibition itself, which uh, which I thought was um, really poetic. So uh, we can take that mind the scrap process, and we can also scale it up. So we've thought about it at the scale of the building. We've thought about it at the scale of the product. We can also throw Manhattan into that meat grinder and think about mind the scrap at the scale of the city. So. Uh, as an example, uh, we developed this project, uh, a machine view of London, or sorry, a machine view of cities uh, that presents uh, a scanning bot that uh, categorizes and maps uh, the millions of buildings from throughout the world in terms of their uh, morphology. So uh, it's sort of an ongoing architectural research project where we're mapping uh, the space of form itself. Typically, when we think about architecture, we think about certain perfect buildings as exemplifying architecture. Here, what we're doing is taking all of architecture, every building ever produced, for example, and beginning to map out that space of form. So what you're seeing here is an example uh, of one of those uh, machine view of the city installation, media installations. Uh, this is a machine view of London, which was on display at the Barbican. Uh, you're, this bot is scanning the million buildings of central London and reorganizing them into a mapped taxonomy of formal similarity. So in this way, we're sort of uh, engaging art and architecture's longstanding fascination with the catalog as a creative medium. Uh, so we're attempting to isolate from this universe of particulars some transcendent rules of aesthetic composition. And this idea of the catalog is something that's really um, kind of central to the way that we work. We're scanning, we're creating catalogs, we're, we're creating catalogs of scrap, we're creating catalogs of um, uh, ceramic waste, we're creating catalogs of buildings. And uh, this is this sort of interesting moment of connection between human and machine perception, the catalog. A catalog is just a data set. Um, Data set is what we call it for machines. Catalog is what we call it for humans, but it's the same thing. Um, and it, it, uh, it has this sort of like really fundamental role in the way that um, information is sort of like structured and communicated across human and machinic actors. So I'll have a little bit more to say about the catalog, uh, the notion of a catalog as a, a theoretical element or a theoretical device uh, in, the second, uh, in the second lecture. Um, but in effect, what the machine view of the city is doing is compiling libraries of buildings. Uh, it's beginning to map out the space of architecture itself. And so our system constructs what might be called cartograms, uh, which are map-like representations, which don't chart geographic space, but instead this space of formal affinity or formal similarity. And here we're looking just purely at the sort of like shapes of um, 
shapes of buildings, uh, but we can take other dimensions of architecture or other ways of scanning architecture and apply a similar kind of uh, method. So, you know, the question of how to classify buildings by their morphological characteristics is sort of a recurring interest for architects and historians, obviously. Architectural manuals and catalogs, uh, in particular, have a lot of building classifications or implicit building classifications, um, often relative to specific stylistic idioms. So you have, you know, you'll have manuals of classicism, you'll have manuals of neoclassicism, you'll have uh, manuals, um, uh, manuals of modernism. There are these manuals which try to distill and catalog uh, architectural elements. So uh, Sebastiano Cerlio, Sir the sort of Italian architect, was one of the first authors of these kinds of catalogs. And a hallmark of Serlio's method was this kind of itemization of architectural elements. So he atomized all of the architectural elements, columns, capitals, and pilasters, and then uh, documented all of their specific characteristics. So there've been a lot of more recent classification methods Bannister Fletcher's um, uh, History of Architecture and Comparative Method, for example, looked at building styles in contrasting relationship to each other um, through what he called, quote, an analysis carried out on the basis of essential parts, close quote. Um, so as he was attending to this comparison, Fletcher's method is actually a kind of like weirdly interesting precedent for probabilistic classification of buildings, which assign a particular building or building element specific categories based on comparative similarity. So when we, when we talk about the comparison of buildings or we talk about the comparison of building elements, it's we're, we're talking about constructing a data set by similarity. And that uh, similarity uh, it's only one further step to say it's a statistical similarity, which makes it a machine learning process. So digital photographs and images are a form of historical record that are uniquely amenable to data analysis. So it used to be that historical photographs, there wasn't a, there wasn't a convenient way to process them uh, for their content. But that's changed, obviously, in the last couple of years with uh, machine learning processes. State-of-the-art AI techniques like convolutional neural networks are robust enough to produce useful identifications uh, and their versatility promises to tease insights from data ranging from historical video footage to satellite imagery. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of projects that actually use this kind of like imagery as the basis for looking at architecture and analyzing architecture as a population or collectively. So the first project I'll mention is the Neoclassifier. So this is a tool for accurately locating a range of specific classical elements, including column types, pediments, cornices, tympana, dentils, and many others, um, images and video. So using the AI image classifier YOLO, which is short for you only live once, the Neo classifier identifies a series of specific elements in input media. So here you can see the Neo classifier scanning these facades and basically extracting all of those elements into a generated catalog. So instead of the catalogs of um, uh, these sort of like neoclassical ca catalogs, which are drawn and set out in advance, these are catalogs which are um, which are generated. So the extracted architectural elements comprise an automatic catalog of these detected parts. And the neoclassifier, it creates this kind of atlas um, that reveals how stable or variable uh, specific stylistic elements are over time. So this is, a, I feel like this is actually a really interesting new way to think about historical problems, actually from the population perspective where we scan entire corpuses of architecture and then begin to think about them uh, actually by their uh, statistical associations. It's very similar to what Lev Manovich uh, has called cultural analytics. Um, and it's, it's a different way to kind of understand the disciplinary history of architecture. 
So um, I'll mention one other example of applying these kinds of image-based methods uh, to um, uh, for the purposes of historical study. So uh, China has obviously a wealth of um, regional building types. And some of these building types have very characteristic um, and unique kind of forms. There's, um, when we think about preserving a set of buildings, a population of buildings, it's, we can't think about just uh, certain perfect examples, right? We don't wanna preserve only the perfect examples or only like one or two examples. We want to preserve a range of different um, examples that show the possible variations of the population. And so, um, uh, so this project, for this project, we were invited by Charles Waldheim and uh, Harvard University's Office for Urbanization to develop a neural model, to classify 18 different uh, regional building typologies um, across China. And so here you can see some of those, uh, some of those typologies. So they cover a range of areas from Guangdong, Fujian, Hunan, um, and many others. And the typologies range from fortress-like compounds to smaller countryside residences. And the objective was to build a tool that could automatically scan large areas and identify uh, those um, uh, historical typologies so we could create a census. What we're trying to do is create a census of those historical building types through AI, a catalog of those historical building types through AI. So here you can see an image of the detection process. Uh, we used a, um, a neural network called UNET, which is very, it's very commonly used in sort of like medical diagnostics. Um, and by generating this automatic inventory of these historical types, designers and preservationists can gain a holistic insight into the variety uh, in a specific architectural type. Um, so, you know, the identification of these specific uh, building types can also help chart the morphological variation within a specific typology and show their distribution across a city uh, or region. So, uh, in effect, the program uh, or this our project applied UNET to create this kind of uh, population inventory of these various regional typologies. So after the outlines were detected and extracted, we could create a statistical histogram showing the frequency of different types of buildings. So here you can see some of those distributions or histograms. What's interesting about this is that it allows you to see the variation in a specific typology. Architecture is built of typologies. Every typology has different sort of like morphological, like elasticity. They're different, you know, it, it, it admits different levels of variation. These statistical histograms chart the level of variation in each of uh, these specific regional typologies. So you can see that some vary, each typology sort of like varies in different ways than the others. So with the, with our scanned building outlines, um, in addition to our scanned building outlines, we also had a historical record of some of the interior plans of some of these buildings. So what we could do is create a neural network that takes those known interior plans and speculates on what the interior plans of our scanned outlines are. So it's almost like creating a kind of AI X-ray vision uh, into the uh, buildings themselves. We know it's not exact, but we have a sense of what the variation of those plans might be using this kind of process. Um, so those generated floor plans, we can then overlay and think about their morphological comparison. And we can create a kind of map of all of those floor plans of all those regional typologies. And what becomes interesting here is we can begin to think about how similar or different the typologies are. Are there some which have unexpected connections or others which are actually quite uh, much more different than we might've expected? Uh, this kind of process can actually answer those questions from a statistical and mathematical point of view. 
Um, so here you can see a sort of like detail, uh, a detail study for one of those uh, types. On the left, you see a, a kind of like sequenced animation of all of the predicted plans for the scanned building outlines that we, uh, that we found. And what's interesting is you get this kind of like fuzzy view of kind of like the perfect version of that plan or the perfect version of that type. Um, now, uh, all of that research was compiled uh, into uh, the Office for Urbanization's uh, recent book, 50 Species Towns. It's a huge book and our research is sort of like a small part of it, uh, but I think it's a part that actually shows the compelling and suggestive applications of machine learning and AI for questions of historical analysis uh, and cultural preservation. Um, I'm going to skip this part. Okay, so that concludes the sort of like first uh, half of the lecture. Uh, Philip, I don't know if I take questions now or if I should take uh, take the questions at the end. Oh, uh, hi, Andrew. I think we can just take a break and leave the questions to the end. Okay. All right. So should we, is a 10 minute break? Is that good? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So we'll take a 10 minute break and be back, uh, I guess, 10 minutes after the next hour. Thank you.
Hey, uh, Chow, should we get started again? Uh, yes, please. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So in the first lecture, I introduced a little bit about certain measures and in particular talked uh, about the application of data, mathematized design, computational processes um, to uh, the creation of kind of like artifacts, uh, to the creation of architecture, to the creation of products, also to the analysis of, um, uh, of buildings at a large scale, including in the city and across the sort of like history of architecture. In this second section, I want to think about design a little bit more as world making uh, and develop a kind of theoretical and historical context for the kinds of um, quantized and mathematized approaches that we take at certain measures. So I wanna begin by changing, pivoting the discussion a little bit around, uh, uh, around AI or um, computational design, which in the first lecture was sort of a tool. It was part of a process that uh, could be applied. Uh, it was something that where we could make tools that sort of uh, transform that process. I didn't mention this explicitly, but a lot of what certain measures does is build software and so everything that you saw in the first uh, uh, in the first lecture was generated from software that we were building or hacking or otherwise transforming. But there's also a way in which uh, that intelligent software will change architecture, not, not only because it changes the process of architecture, but because those things migrate into the things that architects design. In particular, migrate, they'll migrate into the house, they'll migrate into furniture, they'll migrate into all of the objects that are around us, you know, to some extent uh, already have. And so in this second section, I want to think a little bit more about sort of like AI and computation as uh, something that we design, uh, something that's a part of what, a part of the world that we design. And in particular, I really love this quote by uh, Heather Roth, who's a sort of AI researcher, uh, but also a former animal trainer. And she was very struck by the relationships between artificial intelligence and animals. So we usually think of AI as being this thing which is very, very human or sort of like uncomfortably human. Uh, but there's a different way to think about it, which is as an alternate kind of intelligence, which is uh, exemplified by animals. So she said, animals and animal training can teach us quite a lot about how we ought to think about, approach, and interact with artificial intelligence, both now and in the future. And I was struck, kind of struck by this quote because it, it sort of like opens up the way that we can think about intelligent objects uh, in ways which are uh, not so, not so human-centered, maybe. And so the first project that I'd like to look to think about to address this is uh, a project actually about domestic life, but about thinking through domestic life, not as a single house or a single structure, something that's contained in a single structure, but rather as a constellation of different um, uh, sort of devices that we interact with. And uh, the idea is that the house becomes, uh, in this interpretation of artificial intelligence, becomes not a single thing, but actually a cloud uh, of uh, services and objects and intelligent entities that we interact with. So uh, the Berlin buoy, uh, which I'm showing now, considers a house that's basically composed of robots. Uh, every human activity uh, in this reading aligns with a certain set of machine services. So this animation, you can see a kind of like diagrammatic transformation of the home around an occupant according to a kind of synchronized uh, schedule. So uh, these augmented devices are matched with specific actions of domestic life and then secret, sequenced in uh, a minute by minute schedule of the occupants. Here we see a kind of spatial diagram of that hour by hour pulse of life as well as the furniture and the furniture that provisions each moment of that life. 
the house then becomes essentially a collection of these devices, a sort of uh, intelligent network of those devices. The spatial diagram also has a kind of frame. There is a kind of like object that contains these robots, uh, but that object is itself also a kind of autonomous robot. Uh, it changes cladding the, we, the way we might change clothes, suiting up for different seasons or festive occasions, or even just the inclinations of the occupant. Um, so on the left, you can see a sort of like summer version of things where there's a deck attached, the hammock extends outside. Uh, and then you see this constellation of autonomous objects uh, that are occupying uh, the space and reconfiguring dynamically. Now, as I mentioned, the buoy itself is a kind of autonomous robot. So we imagine that uh, it could also sort of switch its base. Uh, it could be fixed in place. It could be suspended. Uh, it could be a quadcopter. Uh, it, 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 it can actually like adopt these various paradigms of mobility and truly create a kind of uh, nomadic, um, a nomadic domestic life. The entire house itself is a roaming droid browsing the landscape uh, and changing our relationship uh, to it. Now, this particular proposal actually comes out of some, uh, or is related to some other research that we've been doing for a long time about what's called autonomous houses. So autonomous houses were these series of houses in the 70s that uh, tried to take all of the functions of living, in particular growing food and recycling waste, and bring them into the house. We're playing with that paradigm a little bit and thinking about this as autonomous, but in the sense of an autonomous driving car. Um, and so the, uh, the Berlin buoy, I think, is sort of in conversation with some of those more uh, historical questions about the boundaries of freedom and autonomy and community in the context of uh, domestic life. So, you know, as we were thinking about sort of like home robotics, we started to think about this spectrum of intelligences. Uh, you know, we, you know, humans hopefully have a kind of like general intelligence, but many uh, scientists have argued that animals often have specific kinds of narrow, what we call narrow intelligences. They're really good at solving particular kinds of problems. Maybe not the full range of problems that we might be adept at, uh, but still they exhibit some uh, aspects of intelligence in that sphere. And then recently, everyone has been contemplating hyperintelligences, things that are perhaps more intelligent than us. And so we already live in a world uh, where there's a spectrum of intelligences, and those intelligences are likely to multiply. We can think about furniture and architecture itself, actually, as occupying different spaces uh, in, this, uh, in this spectrum. So uh, to uh, experiment with some of these animal-like manifestations of autonomous objects, uh, we developed a project called Home is Where the Droids Are, which kind of gives flesh to this future. And so Home is Where the Droids Are, I think, is a kind of like, you know, a, a playful um, take on this question of animal or this idea of animalizing uh, autonomous objects. We developed a series of droids that are part furniture, part animal, um, and uh, inhabit these sort of like post-human spaces. Now, one of the things that's always important for us and kind of like an essential part of the design process is since our office is interested in this interchange, this interaction, this exchange between humans and machines, we're always looking at the way humans see and machines see. So what I talked about earlier, that in each project, we develop a kind of like physical product and a kind of visualization of what's happening for the computational processes, it's, there, it's that kind of parallel. The physical product is what humans see. The digital video, humans can see it, but really it's a glimpse into how uh, machines are seeing the same process. And so for Home is Where the Droids Are, we created this kind of uh, montage that uh, plays on all of the ways that humans currently see in terms of depth maps, 3D scanning, um, uh, and created a kind of like imagined understanding of how droids might be inhabiting this space. And this moment in particular where the two 
plant or the two um, digitally augmented autonomous plants um, fall in love. It's kind of like an interesting moment because we're constructing spaces where not only humans find a certain kind of fulfillment, but also where machines are going to be going about their autonomous and self-guided uh, uh, and potentially desire-related activities. So uh, the project sort of explores the proliferation of autonomous objects uh, that will surround us and which increasingly define their own needs, desires, and loves. And it asks the question, what if we don't humanize technology, uh, but instead uh, animalize it? And so here we see a vignette of this future home populated not only by human occupants, but by these animalized machines. And one of the things that was really fun in terms of like building these uh, devices was that each one had kind of like twitchy way of moving. And each one of those kinds of like mannerisms is actually an aspect of their, uh, their animal-like uh, behavior. Um, okay. So uh, for the last set of projects, I want to return to this idea of scanning and especially scanning and human, or sorry, scanning and machine vision as it relates to nature. Um, how can data index, represent, replicate, or transform nature? Uh, you know, architects have always, architects are always in dialogue with nature. It's not always the sort of like overt material that they are um, uh, shaping uh, as designers, but it's something that's always present. And so what we were interested in is taking this, these kind of like machinic ways of seeing, the ways that we see architecture machinically, and extending those also to um, nature. So the first of those projects is uh, a Google tree. So this is a collaboration with the artist Clément Valla. It's a life-size fabricated tree that's plucked from Google Earth. It's like a metaverse tree. The funny thing is when I show this, uh, when I show this piece or when, I, when we've shown photos or videos of this piece and we don't explain that it's a physical object, everyone's like, oh, this is a really amazing AR object. Very, you know, very cool. But it's a literal thing that we sort of like took from the metaverse and built. And you have this very surreal experience seeing it because it's not something that's like, it's not something that you can sort of, um, that your depth perception processes well. Uh, it's a very um, it's a very unusual kind of uh, encounter. So uh, basically, while Google's apparatus for scanning can deliver within seconds a planetary view of everyday life, uh, the resulting images often create these kind of like very uncanny details. Um, they're deceivingly simplistic. These diagrammatic surfaces represent uh, a mediation of labor. Uh, with the sort of like machine uh, that's scanning those um, uh, that's scanning those contexts. And so uh, you can see here the process that actual process of scanning in action. One of the things that's I think intriguing about this project also is that we're scanning an endangered species. So there's actually very few of this particular kind of tree left. There's a process of preservation actually that we're going through. So just like we were interested in preservation with the scanning of regional typologies, here we're interested in this sort of like biopreservation, uh, but we're also interested in sort of like representing that in a kind of uncanny way. And we have this thing, which is not quite a replica. It's sort of a copy of a copy, a physical, uh, a physical proxy of a data original. And so this is what I think is so interesting about, you know, one of the interesting sort of inversions here is that, you know, data we often think of as being a copy or a record of a real thing. Uh, this is a copy of data. The data in a way is the real thing that this is a copy of, but this is also, you know, real in the sense that it exists in our physical space. So it has that kind of like slippery ontology, I might say. So uh, the, the last project that I want to show is a project that also deals with these questions of scanning the natural world. Uh, but here we're thinking about scanning it for the purposes of engaging it and potentially um, uh, uh, and potentially uh, helping it, remediating it. So this project is part of the newly opened Museum of the, Fu Museum of the Future in Dubai. 
Um, oops. Uh, so built to transform the very perception of the future as we know it, the Museum of the Future is the home to immersive environments that position visitors in an empowering vision of tomorrow. Across each floor of the museum, visitors uh, step into a speculative world of 2071. You experience a space station, a therapeutic clinic, uh, and also enter an Institute for Global Biodiversity and Bioremediation, uh, which is the project that, uh, that we worked on. So for the museum, we imagined uh, an observatory for future planetary ecology. And so, you know, again, the idea is that every space in this museum is a space from 2071. We're imagining a control room for the planet in 2071. Uh, the observatory is a kind of panorama and incubator for newly designed species developed to address ongoing challenges of the climate crisis. Uh, it's the culmination of a floor-wide exhibit of what's called the Heal Institute, which is a fictional NGO uh, tasked with gathering the planet's genetic material, engineering species capable of meeting the challenges of extreme climate, and then redeploying them into the world. So this new space consists of uh, two halves, basically. Uh, the first half is what we call the geoscope. If any of you are familiar with Buckminster Fuller, that might sound somewhat familiar, and uh, I'll get back to that. It's a quantitatively driven global monitoring system that visualizes the progress of bespoke species when they're deployed in these threatened biomes around the planet. So through immersive projection mapping, the geoscope offers a transcalar and data-rich view of the planet from global to microscopic. And the geoscope combines physical models of these speculative species with the dynamic projection mapping to show symbiotic interconnections between scales. So the project is a conscious response to Buckminster Fuller's geoscopes, which were a series of kind of like very large domes on which was projected uh, information about the global state of planetary resources. So we see this not as an extractive view, as Fuller may have, uh, but rather as a replenishing one in which humans play a vital role in the cultivation of the planet. So as a digital globe turns, it reveals new points of intervention and bioremediation. It represents a continuously changing view into the network of monitoring stations across the planet. The coordinating AI uh, dynamically connects with a number of human and non-human agents, drones, satellites, uh, technobiological bio, but sorry, technobiological sensors that are constantly collecting samples and monitoring climate while rebuilding the planet. The data visualization is a glimpse into the expanding consciousness of this AI. It scans specific locations, the Ganges River Delta, Antarctic Island, um, Canada's Nanavut territory for progress against climate catastrophe. So uh, for this project, we drew on the many planetary visualizations of the past century and a half, uh, and especially planetary imaginations of architecture. Our aim was to extend that idea with a simultaneous and multi-scalar view of many aspects of planetary ecology. So here you can see James Wild's Great Globe and uh, Elise Rickluse's Great Globe. Um, one which saw the earth uh, sort of in, inside out on the left and one where you would orbit basically around the earth from the exterior. So very two, very, two sides of the same coin, literally. Um, but they were part of this very long tradition of architecture that thought about the planet. Uh, and that's in a way what we were trying to do in, um, in our modest way with this, uh, with this project. We were also very inspired by um, scientific cabinets, particularly uh, there's a room in the Tyler's Museum in Harlem, Netherlands, absolutely beautiful and perfect room, uh, which uh, showed this kind of like magical one wonderkammer uh, that drew geo sort of drew fragments of the geosphere, biosphere, uh, and so forth from across the planet. 
And it's it's really like this kind of world room. So I wrote a paper a little while ago, actually, about world rooms and world images. This is what we were trying to do. We were trying to create something that was not only a world room, but a world image as well. So the geoscope uh, presents this kind of control room for bioremediation. It shows an evolving web of life and symbiotic interconnections uh, of ecosystem, species, and even bacteria. So the entire system um, is, you know, as I mentioned, monitored by this uh, network of human and machinic agents all working together for a more verdant tomorrow. So an important part of the geoscope are many, these many different uh, kind of vignettes that we produced showing our fictional species uh, in, uh, in context. So here you can see a couple of examples of that. Uh, you see a signal comb jelly, this sort of like um, uh, this super organism basically uh, that has the sort of like communication capacity uh, for detecting toxins. And then uh, at the right, you'll see uh, cryptobiotic wildflowers that uh, they're robust hibernating vegetation that can survive uh, in extreme uh, regions. Other species include our observation robot seahorse on the left, uh, a biomechanical drone that checks on plastic density, CO2 content, and temperature fluctuation, and the fire-resistant tree on the right, uh, which has robust roots, uh, which resist the danger of extreme wildfires. And uh, in each of these, let's see, in the, yeah, so here you can see this sort of like x-ray um, of the fire resistant tree showing this sort of like subcutaneous systems that allow it to be uh, so resilient. The geoscope also affords glimpses into the research of scientists of the Hugh Institute who work tirelessly to confirm the success of regreening the earth. So one of the things that was kind of fun about this project is we got to get, you know, put on some costumes basically and go out into the field and create this kind of like fictional footage uh, of this future where, um, uh, uh, where robots and humans are working together uh, to um, uh, regreen the planet. We even witness moments in their labs uh, where careful analysis uh, is, uh, is undertaken to prepare samples for review to evaluate soil toxins, uh, carbohydrates, uh, and other critical biomarkers. So the geoscope becomes an integrated and multi-scalar panorama of an optimistic possible future. Now I mentioned there are two halves of the show. The other half is what we call the nursery. And in the other half, uh, visitors experience uh, and peer into incubators uh, that are nurturing dozens of these fictional species. So in collaboration with the geneticist, we designed over 80 species of plant, insect, and animal, each with special characteristics um, designed to combat environmental challenges of today and the future. Drawn from a range of biomes, we imagine species like uh, nutrient jelly cactus, radiation sequestering flowers, um, and so forth, which collectively form this kind of biological menagerie. So we were really fascinated by this the type, this architectural type of the menagerie or this architectural type of the Wunderkammer. And this was a way of kind of like imagining what would, that would be uh, in 2071, not only as a place, but as a system. So this is a supercut of all of the physical dioramas of the 3D models. Um, we worked with the highly skilled German fabricator ID3D um, that, that did the, uh, the sort of production of the models themselves, um, according to our design specifications, of course. Each species was meticulously researched, uh, complete with the scientific name, specific climate robust species uh, or features, and um, estimated uh, life cycles. So um, I'll share a couple of examples in some more detail. This is a, a, a multi-species egg incubator that's intended to accelerate repopulation of species. Uh, it can be used to quickly reestablish biological diversity uh, in areas that were previously inhospitable. Uh, this is a radiation sequestering flower 
that's engineered to remediate nuclear waste storage sites by absorbing radioactive isotopes through their roots and into their petals. So you can see this very light kind of like pink tone in some of the petals. The idea is that that's literally the radiation being sucked up. At the microscopic scale, we designed bacteria that symbiotically supported our new species uh, and the larger biomes. Many were paired with larger organisms in beneficial dyads. So we were always thinking about not just the individual species, but their symbiotic clusters. So these bacteria, including uh, um, things, bacteria that could hunt cancer or produce sunscreen or sequester uh, heavy metals. So each species uh, featured holographic data visualization overlays. Um, in some of the videos, you can kind of see these. We use this transparent LCD screen, which is it's really this magical technology, which some of you may have seen it, uh, where basically you can put graphics on the front and they look as if they're floating, like hologra holographically. And so on these kind of incubators, uh, there are these uh, like data visualizations. And so here you see this sort of like supercut of all of those visualizations. In the museum, you would see the models uh, of the species themselves uh, behind these. So uh, all of these species uh, kind of intended to rebuild or recontribute to these seven major ecosystems of desert, aquatic, forest, swamp, alpine, and grassland. And uh, ultimately, the aspiration of this piece is to think about the scale or think about uh, data-driven design as something which is not only about designing specific artifacts, but can actually begin to think about questions of ecological design as well. So with that, I want to return, maybe like come full circle to uh, some of our initial uh, initial prompts about the sort of like status of data-driven design or mathematical design. Um, I mentioned that formulations, this sort of recent book is kind of an, in a way an alibi for certain measures. I never mentioned certain measures in the book, but, uh, but formulations is the kind of prehistory to the practice of um, uh, sort of, I don't know, you might call design science or the practice of uh, uh, an integral transcalar and transdisciplinary design uh, that we undertake. You know, mathematized practices of design have a future, which I've tried to hint at with the work of certain measures, and they also have a past. So uh, I'll start with some basics. Uh, Formulations is a book about design. That's the reason it's here is to sort of like talk about design. But it's also a book about science. Uh, it's a book about models, drawings, catalogs, machines, and systems, and how all of those things pass between disciplines to open creative possibilities. At the end of the day, the book is about seeing why things move from one discipline to another, why a certain form originates in one discipline and moves to another, or a certain idea, or a certain way of working. How does that, how does that happen? Uh, so this is about the past and future of design, but also the connection between culture and technique. We often think of technique as things which are sort of like embodied in particular kinds of machines, and that's true. Uh, but for those machines to be operative, there's a network, a kind of like social culture around it, which also has to function. Formulations is about the facts of form and the frontiers of creative rationality. Unpacked through a reading of mathematics, as it was encountered by architects in the mid 20th century on the eve of digitization. So as it migrated from the scientific lab into the design studio, mathematics became an adaptable method to mediate between the desires of the architects and the complex systems that architects have to wrestle with, including industry, economics, politics, biology, and society. But mathematics also offered designers a collection of strange forms and methods that defied intuition and provoked imagination. I think this is part of the reason why mathematics was such a beguiling thing for architects. It's, it gave this new universe of forms. So paradoxically, mathematics was a means to exceed subjectivity 
through the universal facts of form. It was this sort of like extreme version of rationality, but it was also a medium to estrange the intuition to the point of fresh creation. It was this way to encounter things that were bizarre and strange and enigmatic, but then by encountering those provoke new kinds of, uh, uh, new kinds of imagination. So formulations explores these issues by deconstructing a series of diptychs um, in, uh, of architecture and mathematics. So when I say diptych, I mean an, you know, a pair of images that have a certain very specific relationship. And one of the most emblematic for me was uh, the architect Ann Ting's diptych of Ting and Lu Khan's city tower project, which you can see on the left, side by side, against a crystalline maquette of Watson and Crick's DNA double helix. So this is a, uh, this is a pair that, uh, that Ting herself presents uh, in an article that describes her methodology. She argued that the common code of natural and architectural structures uh, was the mathematics of crystal lattices. So crystal lattices are basically the underlying DNA, as it were, of both of these. She believed crystal form could collapse geometric and biologic structure into new visual and technical unity. And so, you know, the more I looked, the more I found of these kinds of dyads, these kinds of pairs with echoes in the two disciplines. Um, I encountered the, these kind of like common lineages of models. So tension string maquettes that were developed in uh, France and Germany in the early 19th century seems to reappear in the work of designers like Le Corbusier. Models or drawings of warped surfaces that wouldn't have been out of place in a Belle Epoque scientific lab appeared unexpectedly in 1960s archives uh, of place in places like the AA or uh, Ulm. Images that seem to fuse architectural and mathematical drawing uh, also surfaced in strange places. So this is particularly true of crystal drawings. Mathematical drawing and architecture became a way to marshal quantified information and to discipline sight. And in particular, you can see these sort of like, uh, you know, the, the sort of like mathematical catalogs of crystal form on the right, for example, um, and John Fraser's thesis project uh, from the AA on the left, which has this eerily similar kind of like crystal intuition. Um, so these kinds of drawing methods dislocated architecture from classical modes of drawing, uh, particularly monocular perspective, and supplied it with an array of new drawing practices um, in which the methods of calculation were more visible. I mean, you see, feel like in this drawing, you're actually seeing a geometric problem being worked out. That was the sense of these uh, modes of mathematical drawing. So gradually, I also started to find patterns of transdisciplinary exchange, not only these sort of like echoes of form, but also specific sort of interactions. So uh, on the left, you can see uh, a model from the architect Peter Pierce, uh, did a really amazing book in the early 80s called Structure and Structure and Pattern, or sorry, Structure and Nature as a Pattern for Design. Um, he was developing a really interesting approach to minimal surfaces. And then on the right, you have Alan Schoen's um, uh, images from Alan Schoen's like really seminal uh, uh, piece on triply periodic minimal surfaces. So Alan Schoen was a mathematician. It turns out that the two of them corresponded and actually credited each other in their respective books. So this is very intimate kind of interaction between an architect on the one hand and uh, a mathematician on the other. So for some architects, mathematics furnished a kind of ur science uh, through which designers could engage the physical and social sciences more broadly. Mathematics was a conceptual intermediary uh, between the natural sciences and creative method. The role of mathematics vis-a-vis -vis architecture thus essentially situates design's whole position relative to the natural sciences. You know, it's not really possible to think about architecture in relation to biology or architecture in relation to chemistry or any of those other things without thinking about architecture in relationship to mathematics first. So what were the conduits then of exchange between mathematics and architecture? 
That's kind of what formulations is all about. And I make the argument that there are some specific media of um, exchange that were really fundamental to this conversation. So at the core of formulations is a map of four media of transdisciplinary exchange, models, machines, cabinets, and manuals. So these collectively act as vessels of knowledge and objects of desire and imagination. Through the use and misuse of these media, because there was plenty of misuse, architects created a spectrum of ways uh, in which mathematics uh, could be engaged in a variety of inclinations uh, and agendas. So the story of mathematics and design is not a monolithic thing. It's a thing of which there are many, many subthreads. So uh, formulations tells the story of the visual, epistemic, technological, and especially social exchange um, through these media among the individuals, collectives, subcultures, and institutions that they connected. So uh, I'll offer a few words around each of these kinds of like, um, uh, each of these kinds of like vessels or encapsulations of knowledge in turn. So first models. Modern architects found muses, archetypes, and bridges uh, to a new universe of calculated figuration in mathematical models of the 19th century. So designers deliberately signaled alignment with specific scientific concerns in part through the scientific models that they chose to collect. So the architect Max Bill, for example, collected topological models. Fry Otto essentially was, connecting, was collecting soap films and Ting collected crystals. And each collection enshrined a constellation of formal desires and methodological tactics. These models served both as kind of like wondrous exemplars, these sort of like objects of admiration, uh, and also um, uh, exemplifications of method. So it, they had, it was both the product and the process that were important here. So the second is machines. Uh, second type of medium is machines. Over the 19th and 20th centuries, architects encountered and adapted and basically hacked a range of mathematical uh, drawing, surveying, uh, projecting, and seeing machines. So ellipsographs, conchoidographs, planimeters, all of these not only recorded, but amplified and transmuted design ideas. Um, the tools placed the activities of perceiving, recording, remembering, knowing, and drawing into interdependent uh, and mechanically modulated relationships. And I feel like that's really critical. It's like all of those activities used to be separate things, but machines allow them to become part of a continuous, what we would call workflow. So such machines migrated across disciplinary boundaries, equally useful to mathematicians, astronomers, surveyors, architects, and in so doing, they diffused technique uh, throughout disparate epistemic cultures. So the cabinet uh, or collection convenes a pantheon of models and specific cultural priorities. And so uh, in the historian uh, Joanna Malt's words, uh, it quote, attempts to encompass and order knowledge in a single case, close quote. So like if models and machines are particular fragments of knowledge, Cabinets are the way that all that knowledge is organized, becomes synthetic, and is expressed as a kind of network. So the book, Formulations itself, kind of like adopts the tactics of the cabinet as an associative device for thinking through transdisciplinarity. It's kind of collecting some of these various objects, presenting them, and trying to draw connections among them. So, uh, the final kind of medium is the manual. So a manual or catalog, again, that word, uh, is um, a manual or catalog of organized mathematical surfaces, symmetries, formulas, and crystals, or crystals. Um, those kinds of things were essential media for uh, conveying um, mathematical knowledge of form to designers. Catalogs were not only references for specialists, but they also 
acted as these kind of like distilled visual guides to the uninitiated outsider. Designers consumed scientific catalogs, which were often like lavishly illustrated, and they replicated them often through their own kind of like architecturally inflected catalogs. So, you know, the 60s and 70s was sort of like a huge high point for this kind of practice. And so, like, for example, the architects who were interested in crystallography read the sort of like scientific crystallographic catalogs, but then they would create their own architectural kind of like um, versions of that where they would apply crystallography to architecture, but they would still talk about crystals in the same mathematical way. Um, there were also some sort of like uh, maybe simpler versions of some of those catalogs. Uh, there's one particular which is on the right, uh, which I found really fascinating. It's this, uh, it's basically a cubic book called the Cubic Construction Compendium. And the Cubic Construction Compendium is a collection, a catalog, of uh, ways that you can apply the cube in architecture. Um, everything from the fur from furniture to building to city. Uh, it was actually published by the architectural collective, the Cubic Construction Center, uh, which claimed to have, quote, uh, put aside all claims of artistic ownership and actively seeks to encourage the use of its ideas by everyone, close quote. So there's this funny way in which they were proposing a kind of open source version of architecturalized uh, cube. For them, the cubic grid was actually an archetype of spatial equity. Uh, and their catalog was a free open source design resource for humanity. So through those media, we can tease out a couple of specific themes. Um, Drawing on Lorraine, historian Lorraine Daston's uh, notion of biographies of scientific objects, formulations presents, quote, biographies of method, close quote, which are episodes that configure a group of interlocutors, projects, institutions, and tools around a particular kind of mathematical knowledge. Every biography of method is also a sketch of a particular type of knowledge subculture as well as a specific type of designer that spans disciplinary boundaries. And I think this is really critical. When, when, discipline, when, sorry, when transdisciplinarity happens, it's about bringing different people together, but then it's also about defining a particular kind of designer who is in that culture and who kind of exemplifies some of those methods. The second major theme, uh, which we've seen throughout the presentation is this theme of perception, vision. Uh, mathematical ways of seeing expanded architecture's geometric imagination. From surveyed triangulation to stereoscopic drawing, mathematized sight sponsored what Jonathan Crary called uh, the, quote, ongoing mutation of visuality, close quote, which I understand to be the gradual technological transmutation of how designers see and imagine. So the third theme is form, which is obviously something that's very interesting to me. Through geometry, mathematics has long offered a way to diagram and imagine intricate forms. Since at least the 1960s, well before the digital turn, some designers have also used the applied subfields of topology to produce odd new drawings of objects caught between dimensions. So a big part of the genesis of formulations actually was this interest in thinking about the origins of topology and design. So for architects who saw the potential of topology, uh, topological transformations became a practice by which perceptual paradox and spatial fact could be squared, allowing design a radical pliant uh, or radical spatial pliancy. And then finally, um, a few words about the, the fourth theme, which is actually society. So sometimes we may think that mathematics is something sort of like abstract, sort of like very disconnected from society, um, but it's actually something that's, that connection of mathematics and society was really essential to some of the most radical social thought of architecture um, in the last century. So projects like Yona Friedman's Flatrider and Buckminster Fuller's World Game transposed mathematical models 
of economics or politics into, behavior, into a behavioral design framework. So Friedman, for example, imagined a mathematical ISO effort uh, as a sort of uh, meteorological map that charted the, uh, the quote, acts and choices uh, of the inhabitants, close quote. So in behavioral economics, there's this idea of choice architecture. And what Friedman is talking about here is very similar to that idea. The idea that architects are not only about sort of like proposing spatial ideas, but also the scenarios or the choices uh, that people inhabiting those spaces um, uh, will have to take. And, you know, at the end, Friedman is, he, the reason why he takes that on is because he feels like um, architects can no longer design, quote, for millionaires, but for millions of individuals, close quote. There's this mandate, this imperative that architects scale up their methods, and it's only through really computation uh, that that's possible. So together, these practices of drawing, modeling, seeing, and measuring um, play out and shape not only one culture, but several different cultures of math mathematical design. So what's uncovered in this research, I think, is not only a rich legacy of formal experimentation, but also a kind of folklore. It's like the, the rumors, the sort of like letters and correspondence between people. Um, which ultimately creates these kinds of technical subcultures. And that becomes the way that these subcultures are born, grow, wither, and reborn. Of course, it's about technique, but it's also about the kind of relationships that all of these designers and mathematicians and other experimentalists have with each other to create a coherent culture of design. So at its core, Formulations is a study of the social dynamics of transdisciplinarity centered on the prehistory of computational design. So placed in this geography of particular images, drawings, models, and catalogs, uh, design rationality can be more acutely quantified and circumscribed. So throughout this whole arc uh, that I've outlined of technique, form, culture, what's perpetuated across time and I think through certain measures into the future, is a conviction that mathematics and its, uh, its pair data um, enable design to radically multiply its capacities. Through mathematics, architecture might decode the hidden forces shaping design, synchronize architecture and nature, wrestle with the complexities of science and politics, uh, and amplify beyond measure the intricate aesthetics of scientific visuality. But perhaps, and this is what I think is maybe most interesting, is I'm not interested in rationality for the sake of sort of like creating purely rational form. I am interested in it for the um, generative power it has for the imagination. And perhaps the power of mathematics uh, is something kind of paradoxical. It's capacity to bring architecture up to the edge of rationality and to peek beyond it. It's the power to transubstantiate an excess of reason into poetry. It's power to create poetry from reason or amplify this intensity of reason till it becomes poetry. I find that a beautiful idea and this possibility that with mathematics, we can behold the waking dreams of science and dare to draw them. Uh, I think that's potentially a beautiful thing. So, that's what I have for the lecture. I would be, thank, thank you for spending some time with me. I'd be happy to um, respond to any questions that might be, uh, that might be out there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Andrew. I think it's, it's a fascinating lecture. Uh, as to too many materials, uh, I don't know where to start. Um, but um, uh, um, maybe, while waiting some questions, I, I can start to just, um, well, first, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I think I, I've, I found two very interesting tensions in your presentation, but it's more kind of a general one. Um, maybe I start from that one. So 
uh, in, in your research and also practice, you kind of embrace uh, the cutting edge technology, like machine learning, like, like AI, those kind of uh, uh, newly advanced technologies. But on the other hand, um, I, I, I feel you particularly interested in, in history. So, so every project you present has a kind of historical anchors, um, particularly focusing on mathematics for sure. Um, uh, but what I found interesting is those mathematical models you referring to um, is those models uh, in history, but not in a kind of contemporary development of, of, of mathematic uh, field, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's always a kind of delay or lag. Um, maybe that's that's happening to 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 all the projects in architecture. We we we, in, we are interested in, in technology, but more kind of you know, historical presence. So how I don't know how you how you feel this kind of delay or or lag or or is there a possibility we can uh, learn or, or utilize some kind of contemporary mathematical models to to open more possibilities? That's maybe my my, my first question. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I think this idea of latency uh, that you that you refer to, I think historically that's probably been true because there are communication gaps. So uh, part of part of the ability to kind of like engage with another discipline is yeah. having a culture that allows that kind of engagement. And building a culture takes time. It's something that's it's a very human activity. So it takes it takes some time. One of the things that I think is very different in the last few years is that uh, code becomes a way or a vessel for allowing that kind of exchange to happen much more, much more quickly. And yeah. so just like, you know, machines, uh, sort of like drawing machines and seeing machines in the past allowed mathematical knowledge to be encapsulated and then reused in other contexts. Code allows that not just for scientific disciplines, but for almost every discipline. And so yeah. what we see today is that data has become this kind of like common language for not only all of the sciences, but almost almost every discipline. And mm -hmm. to the extent that architects can sort of like engage with and understand data, um, they can reduce the latency of that disciplinary exchange uh, by quite a bit. And so, you know, data and software then become this way that we can accelerate the process of assimilating what's happening, uh, what's happening in other uh, in other disciplines. And so, you know, still there will be some, uh, there'll be some latency and this sort of like, but the other thing that happens on the social side is that uh, we're, we're sort of like leveraging the power of uh, uh, digital media as communication devices. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's really interesting is that when you look at the very early origins of digital media in like the 60s and 70s, there was a real emphasis on it, uh, emphasis on the fact that it was a communication technology. You know, we think about it, I, I, maybe not quite in that way. I mean, I think since the advent of the internet, maybe that's come back a little bit, but it was really like front and center, this idea of technology's communication apparatus. And so the fact that we have new kinds of communication apparatus today allow us to organize those cultures, those sort of like thought collectives that allow interdisciplinary exchange um, in new and potentially like faster ways, definitely more global ways. So I think there are a lot of promising developments that actually allow for the acceleration and intensification of the use of a lot of these kinds of tools. I mean, you know, like for example, the adoption of the adoption of new neural models. I mean, there's nobody has mm -hmm. to wait until there's a published paper. Everything will be out there. The sort of like models will be out there. People can download and, uh, and use uh, immediately. And so yeah. that this sort of like friction and building cultures that was once there, I feel like is not there. It, you know, it's, I mean, there's, there might still be some, but that's changing quite a bit, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, um, well, 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 I was doing my, my own PhD research. I, I was looking at the, the neuroscience that I found, I found it really, really interesting. There is a lot of contemporary development of neuroscience, but the architects talking about, uh, we're always referring to kind of the older version or the, the kind of the, the classical version of those understandings of how brain works. That's that's kind of, I just feel that's kind of nature of archi architects, how we think about things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there is, there's a way in which, 
you know, one of the things that was interesting in putting together formulations and I think is interesting as kind of like an observer of the digital scene today is that there's plenty of kind of like misunderstanding of architects of other kinds of sciences. Yeah, but true. on some level, there's sometimes it can be a productive misunderstanding. I mean, architecture is a creative discipline. And so yeah. really there's, um, there's, I mean, I don't want to be overly simplistic, but there's a way in which if it's productive from a creative point of view, it has mm -hmm. some utility. So yeah, those sure. are things which I'm like, uh, I don't necessarily, I, I don't have like a huge problem actually with some of those misunderstandings because I feel like in many cases they can be, they can be actually pretty productive. Yeah, uh, I, I saw there's a, there's a question in, in chat box. Yeah. Uh, let's see, thank you for your lecture. Could you please say more about the step process of defining specific final result based on the possibilities of catalog data, specifically uh, the media multiplicity of results uh, or moments of becoming versus the finality of the physical form, perhaps in the context relationship between human and machine ways of seeing? Yeah, this is a really, this is a great question. And I think kind of like gets to the heart of what we're, of what we're trying to do um, in this sort of like dialogue between catalog, which is like this vast space um, and, uh, and specific design proposal. And, you know, you know, between catalog and proposal, there's also, there's also one other step, which is the combinatorial universe of how we recombine those, uh, how we recombine those fragments. So the sort of like path from catalog to specific, uh, to specific form is something which, uh, you know, necessarily undergoes certain criteria of, you know, maybe performance, but also sort of like taste and desire and all of those other sorts of um, very, uh, very human sorts of things. And so uh, what, you know, some of the, some of the forms, like some of the forms of mind the scrap, for example, are, uh, aspects of them are determined by the specific sorting algorithms that we have for the underlying data. Right, and aspects of them are determined by a target form that we provide, uh, and then there are all sorts of other sorts of like parameters around sort of like the tightness of the fit or um, uh, the level of resolution that we want in the final model, and so there's this there's this like set of parameters uh, which are about the process itself, which uh, which we have the opportunity to just sort of like edit and tweak and define. In order to achieve, um, in order to achieve a specific form, and so the catalog, the catalog is it's sort of like obviously a kind of like machinic um, repository. But the ways in which we sort, the ways the ways in which we map, the ways in which we sort of like organize all that information is also uh, is also machinic. And so there's a part of our intuition that we have to encode in the machine in order to create those, in, in order to sort in a way that we like find most tasteful basically. Um, but then there's an aspect of, uh, of what we do also as designers, which is set the object of desire. Um, so all those mind the scrap pieces were basically um, cubes. Like we wanted it to construct a cube, but then we uh, specified uh, certain areas where it could diverge from the cube in order to sort of like make best use of the underlying material. And so there's this kind of like sculpting process almost where you're like setting priorities and deprioritizing other areas, uh, which ultimately guides the machine um, in order to sort of uh, fill in the blanks. So it becomes this kind of dialogue, um, which obviously the designer has final veto power on um, but the machine starts to feel like a material. It's like you're you're sculpting with the machine, which becomes this kind of like um, thing that provides that resists, but also affords certain things. Um, so that's I don't know. That's the best. That's the best way that I can. I, I mean, it's some or you, another way to think about it is that you're in dialogue with a collaborator who's sometimes a little bit stubborn. <laughs> And so we've often, you know, anybody who's done any kind of like a group project has had collaborators that are stubborn. Uh, sometimes this can feel a little bit like you're collaborating with a stubborn, uh, a stubborn workmate or something. But it's a stubborn, it's a stubborn workmate that actually has your best interests at heart. So anyway, maybe uh, to sort of like connect this to, or to sort of like uh, give this artificial intelligence the sort of like personhood that maybe it wants. That's one way to think about it. 
Well, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Jiang Jiawei, who is also a assistant professor from our college. Um, hello. Hi, Chao and, and Andrew. Yeah, Hi. thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for the lecture. Uh, uh, it's a quite inspiring lecture. And uh, I would love to have a question for you. Um, I'm extremely interested in the part you show uh, the 3D scanning of the architectural elements, the statues, that part very architectural, historical. Um, uh, we know that in the history, uh, there are a great many different high quality dictionaries or treatises by the historians showing uh, the different very high quality descriptions of uh, a piece of architectural work or uh, the description of a certain part of like a capital, in temperature, a pediment, or a, 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 a statue, etc. Um, so uh, if we want to adopt the technology of natural language processing and combine with, uh, let's see, a great many of the illustrations in these dictionaries and treatises uh, in combination uh, with what you have done, those 3D scannings of this digital data you have already got. So how can we combine the text, the illustrations in these books and dictionaries and the 3D scanning? There are three different things. And if we want to push and extract the knowledge from the old books and combining with all this data we currently gathered, from the 3D scanning, do you have any good idea to show us how can we conduct such a survey? Yeah, this is a really, really interesting question. I mean, one of the things which I uh, haven't shown in this lecture, but you know, I've tried to do a fair bit of work with the application of ML to, um, to language, and in particular, the language of architecture, like how architecture is sort of like described and expressed. Um, there's a project on the Certain Measures website called Textonics. It's a, it's a couple of years old now, but basically it's a project that analyzes these canonical architectural texts and tries to extract the sort of um, sentiment from them. So you can sort of like get a sense of whether the, the text is sort of like very argumentative or very sort of like positive or very neutral. Um, and I think this sort of like ex expansion of NLP in the last couple of years has been really um, you know, is really interesting actually for those kinds of uh, historical questions. And I think to combine it with those kinds of um, catalogs, those kinds of treatises is really fascinating. I mean, there's an aspect of what you're talking about, which is trying to, which is thinking about what I sometimes call an autocritic, which is um, a, a, a basically like an AI enabled critic, which has a specific diction and a specific way of talking about architecture which is disciplinarily specific. And, uh, you know, I, my sense, I mean, this is sort of shooting from the hip, but my sense is that, you know, the, the multi, multimodal models, uh, which are used um, uh, in things like, you know, like stable diffusion and Dolly uh, are models that allow you to take, um, to basically map different kinds of media into the same um, into the same sort of like high dimensional uh, space. Basically, they they allow you to take very different kinds of um, uh, underlying data and uh, make them interoperable in a way. And so, you know, you know, Dolly and those kinds of things take take two different media, but there's no reason why you couldn't have more than two. And you know, by the way, you can also do that with sound and other kinds of media as well. So you can have um, uh, you know, a lot of the very interesting, very interesting sort of like generative sound models basically are text, text to music kind of processes. So the idea is that you can expand those kinds of models in principle to other kinds of media, including 3D scans, which could make for a very interesting kind of interoperation. Now, the tricky thing, as always, is the sort of like collection of data um, related to those kinds of those kinds of models. And to get good results, I mean, you just need usually some very significant data sets, but it might be possible to sort of like uh, extend a current model or um, uh, refine the training of a current model in such a way that you could create that kind of like, um, uh, you know, the neoclassical critic or something like this. I think it's a really, I think it's a really interesting idea. And one of the things that I think, you know, people often think about the implications of AI for the craft of architecture, but I think the craft of criticism 
will also, you know, has the potential also to be um, uh, to be impacted or transformed. And I think that's a little bit of what you're uh, of what you're hinting at is like, you know, can we can we can we have Serlio as a critic also? Uh, can we bring Serlio back and have him respond to to buildings today? I mean, it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, Andrew, there, there's one more question um, from the, the chat box. Are there any introductory book recommendations for new students interested in data, data science? It includes free open source like Cube or recommended some data-driven design tool? Oh, this is a hard question. I'd probably like, I don't know. To be totally honest, most most of the things that I'm reading these days are kind of like directly related to some of the research that I'm doing, yeah, which I would sure. probably not categorize as like introductory introductory texts. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry that I probably that I can't give a better recommendation for this. I mean, there ha if if you want like like very, very basic introduction, um there have been uh, I mean, there've been a number of texts around like um, Oh, Casey Reyes did one a couple of years ago that are about sort of like drawing and code. I, I'm I, I'm off the top of my mind. I'm afraid I don't have any great recommendations because I'm maybe because I'm like deep into these other kinds of problems. But uh, I I'll give it some thought, and if I have any good ones, I'll I'll relay it. Okay, okay. Well, there's one more question. Um, do you think automatic design will be far away? Where's the difficulty? Uh, sorry, one second. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, um, oh, it depends the level of design. Yeah, I, I think like our, I think sometimes we, we intuitively might simplify actually like what design is. Uh, because at the end of the day, there's, you know, there are some very specific tasks in design. And we tend to think about design as, a, as like almost in terms of those tasks, um, you know, like the drawing of a plan from specific requirements or um, the generation of an image from uh, certain sorts of, um, uh, from certain sorts of aspirations or something like this. But a lot of design is actually coordinating and orchestrating very different kinds of media um, in order to basically like corral them in the same in the same direction. And I think there's no doubt that AI and ML are going to sort of uh, uh, you know transform the way that architecture happens. But the activity of a designer is something which uh, I think is is going to persist. I mean, the thing is that you know people who have had um, experience with uh, sort of like text text to image models, for example, I mean, sometimes it can take like hundreds of prompts and a lot of editing to sort of get the image or the sort of like uh, vignette that you actually want. I mean, you could produce a lot of stuff and it's great stuff, but aligning that with your desire as an architect is still a, uh, is still a challenging thing. And I think that there's, a you know, you know, designers have to orchestrate not only sort of like drawings and images, but they have to communicate with clients. They have to sort of like get, you know, persuade contractors that they have to do all sorts of other things um, in order to realize um, a design. And so uh, I think that activity, that activity is gonna is gonna persist. I think it'll be, it'll definitely be transformed. Uh, but uh, I mean, I don't think designers are going away anytime soon. Although they'll be doing definitely different things. Okay. Um, well, uh, Andrew, I, I just want to, to raise your last question before we, we end the session. Um, well, um, so that's what I mentioned by the saying the second tensions in your lecture. Um, I think that the second part is is kind of more straightforward and it, it's really fascinating talking about digital materiality, uh, post-human centric attitude of design. Uh, but I'm kind of more interested in, in the first part of your lecture. Um, there's, there's a kind of tension. Uh, on the one hand, you are interested in kind of raw materials, reuse materials, which is always kind of have a fuzzy geometry. On the other hand, you're trying to kind of 
precisely describe the, the geometry by manipulating the data process. Um, so there is a kind of a lot of computational energy uh, costed in the process in order to generate the final result. But there's always classical question in this kind of de uh, data-driven design, uh, how you think about the legibility of those process uh, in, the, in the final result. Um, someday this maybe you, you... <laughs> I'm so glad you brought this up because I don't know. So um, uh, Philippe Morel and Henrietta, Henrietta Beer just released a book around disruptive mm -hmm. technologies and design. And in that book, I have an essay called On Legibility. And, okay. uh, and so in that essay, I actually ex explicitly deal with this question of legibility. In fact, I was just at the Bartlett yesterday for the book launch where I talked about that, uh, that issue. And so like really this question of legibility is kind of at the heart of a lot of what we do because <clears throat> this it's very connected with this question of perception. Perception is sort mm -hmm. of like a, you know, you have, you have perception and then you have some sort of like processing of perception and then you have maybe like legibility in terms of like yes. this hierarchy of sophistication in, term of, in terms of a hierarchy of sophistication. And, you know, the question of what is legible or what constitutes legibility, I think is a really fundamental question that's um, re-raised by ML and AI because ML and AI are sort of like, I don't know, I don't know if you could call it perceiving, but they're definitely like reading things. Like the question of what is yes. machine readable there's a history of machine readability. There's a history of, you know, you know, originally machine readable meant that something was encoded in a specific format that was not human readable. It was either machine readable or it was human readable. I think what's different about today is that machine readable and human readable are like converging. A machine can mm -hmm. read everything that a human can read. There's no, there's no difference anymore between human and machine readability. And but then the question becomes, okay, like what is what is readability? Is it just decoding symbols? Is it sort of like creating relationships among those symbols? Is it creating some sort of like critical response to those? And uh, I think the, the sort of like craft of a designer in a way is understanding legibility. I mean, maybe get to maybe get back to this question of like, will the, will the designer grow? Will the designer go away? The designer still has to understand kind of like what should be legible in a project. What are the things that should be legible, and how do you communicate that? How do you how do you put that out there so that it, so that it is legible? Um, so like at a cultural level, that's a very important uh, idea. But also just like at a pragmatic level, when you know, I I like the, this idea of sort of like taking noise and making it signal is a process of legibility. It's a mm -hmm. process of trying to sort of like read something that seems illegible actually, but then elevate it to a point, refine it to a point where it actually has a clear reading. And that's something that I think is um, really interesting about these kinds of new tools and the way they kind of like change what reading means um, and what legibility means. Like in the seventies, there was, you know, whole, whole, like all postmodernism is built on the question of reading yeah. and legibility yeah. and reading form. And there was this really great article by um, Gendel, Gendel Sonos, where he talked about reading and he was like, well, you know, computers are terrible because they take architecture into the space of engineering and it's not culture. And I think his argument was that, you know, machines are not reading anything, but in fact, now machines can read. And that whole argument is no longer somehow like valid. So anyway, that's kind of a long way of saying that I think you've hit on something fundamental, which I totally agree with. And I would be very curious to hear your perspective um, on that paper because legibility is absolutely this fundamental yeah. element of what we have to think about today um, from a human and machine perspective. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I definitely come lo looking at those the, that article you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think it's, it's about time. Thank you, Andrew, again for, for this long lecture. I know it's kind of really long. It's longer than the usual lecture we, we did. Uh, at other place, oh, but it's a part of it's part of PhD course. I, I hope all the kind of attendees you can you are being inspired by, by Andrew's work. Um, so thank you again, and let's keep in touch. Maybe continue the discussion, maybe in in other formats. Yeah, okay. yeah. It was a, it was a pleasure. A lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.